Welcome back to another video with me, JD, the last of 2024 and maybe the last one that I do full stop. Um, as many of you are aware, especially if you follow me on Twitter, this is going to be my last year making weekly content, which I'm going to jump into in a minute and explain uh, that and, and so much more really. Um, answer some of the questions you guys have been grateful enough to submit. Uh, and really across like a lot of interesting topics about myself and my motivations, about Supercoach and where it's heading, about other content creators and content creation itself. And there's some memes in there, of course, couldn't forget the memes. But before I jump into all that, I did want to say once again, thank you um, to everyone that's been a viewer, a contributor, a commenter, uh, even a hater over the last few years. Appreciate all of you uh, has made this experience, I guess, special and fun and something unique and different and memorable for me. Uh, and I'll you know, cherish it going forward for all its good parts and all its bad parts as well. Um, now I'm still going to be around. Uh, I may even produce content in the preseason. I don't know, but I will definitely not be doing weekly content anymore, which, which we'll jump into in a second. Um, so yeah, uh, once again, big thank you to everyone. I'm going to jump into the, all the Q and A that people have submitted and, um, yeah, let's, let's crack in. Uh, so in terms of how I've done this, um, thanks everyone that submitted those questions um, uh, on like Twitter, forms, YouTube, whatever it may be. I've tried to compile them into like the common kind of questions that I got or saw into like grouped topics and we'll crack into them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so yeah, let's start with firstly, why? Why am I moving away from content? Um, why have I decided to stop? And... I think there's a number of good reasons. I mean, the main one is always going to be what's going on in personal life between um, work and a young family. Um, I don't think I've got sufficient time to cover all three well and take care of myself, you know, fitness and health and all that. Um, so I have to kind of cut back on one. And I think super coach and fantasy content, at least weekly content is definitely where I'm going to do that. I still enjoy playing uh, a lot and I, I plan to continue playing next year uh, as, as of right now across both formats but the reality is like part of I guess what I enjoyed making content for was to dive into the strategy of the game and to talk through where I thought there were edges and really to test my thinking against the best out there and to get feedback and improve on it and learn from it. And I think I have done a lot of that over the last few years, but when you try and make content, which is aimed at, I guess, the really top end coaches, um, and even hopefully something that other content creators can enjoy, like I find it difficult not to hold myself to a certain standard in terms of the level of research I'm doing and putting into um, my content. Uh, and that means, you know, you feel the pressure to watch almost every game across the weekends if you're really going to compete up at the top end and, and provide good advice that you're proud of. And while I could continue to do that, I think that takes away too much from things I could be doing with family uh, on the weekend. And that's ultimately the main driver for me stepping back. I don't think I can create my type of content to level that I'd be happy with and also um, be a good dad and husband and all these other things. And I'd like, I know where my priorities lie. I've always known where they've, they've lied. So uh, I think that's really the easiest way to um, articulate it. There are probably a couple of other sub points on this, which is um, one, I have found it less fun to make content this year, partly because of round zero. I wouldn't like place all the blame on that, but the preseason and the strategy is where I have the most fun. And while there were new elements that round zero brought in from a strategic perspective, which were fun to think through and analyze. Ultimately, I found too much of my preseason research came down to, it kind of doesn't matter. We'll just see what happens in round zero, then pick teams after that. And that wasn't like that, that, that uh, took away a lot of the fun for me um, when it came to, to making content this year. Um, so yeah, uh, between, between that and the pressure, I think those are two pretty good reasons to step away from it. Um, yeah, so I think I think those are probably the big ones. Um, Trying to figure out what else I haven't answered on this page. What is your day job? Okay, so without going into too much, I am uh, at least I, like I'm reasonably senior compared to where I was maybe four, three, four years ago when I started doing this. Um, I uh, I work in strategy. I, I lead a strategy team, uh, and I work in financial well-being. 
Um, so I work alongside like behavioral scientists to understand how people make decisions around their money and then hopefully design better products, experiences, services to help them improve with how they manage their money. And you can kind of see between that uh, and and Supercoach, like where the real crossover is, right? Supercoach is a combination of numbers and 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 strategy. You know, it's, it's what I'm good at. It's what I like doing. You can really see um, once you apply that to sport, that just like it's a, a perfect harmony and, and part of the reason why I really enjoy it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to do weekly videos anymore. I think the, there's too much of a time um, sink and drain um, that goes into making good weekly content, especially uh, it's hard as well for all super coach and fantasy content creators, because anything you make is almost irrelevant the week after. It makes it really hard. Nothing you build stands forever. So sinking a lot of time into something that you know only has a, a lifespan of like three, four days before it's irrelevant. It, it's tough. But yeah, um, I think that probably covers most of this. In terms of what's next, uh, as, as I mentioned, I'll continue to play. I still plan um, to, to play next year. Um, I'll probably still tweet about it and be annoying on Twitter. Uh, and I may even make some preseason content if round zero goes um, or if others um, want to have me for interviews or whatever it may be. But there are no plans when it comes to um, creating anything myself going forward. All right, will you be doing any content? I feel like I've already touched on this a little bit, but do I tend on making any Supercoach um, analysis in the future? Not really, um, and I probably won't produce any preseason content. I might. We'll see. We'll see how I feel about it uh, next year, because it is my favorite part of it. But at the same time, if I'm not going to do weekly videos, it might be nice to actually just step back and have a year where I am a regular player, just like everyone else, and not doing content at the same time. Uh, may find some pleasure or some insight in doing that, which I lose by you know doing what I've done the last three four years. Um, so yeah. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Jackson Davey. I'll still be active in the like discords and forums that I'm active in. I may pop up for guest appearance stuff, but I currently am not planning to be active myself, but I may be, I'm not ruling it out. Um, yeah. So will you continue to play for your own enjoyment? I will. And I'll occasionally tweet about it. Um, is this the end of FT FTTV? Absolutely not. Uh, so I haven't spoken to George and Eno about what their plans are for next year, but I assume um, George will still be producing content. I have a feeling I'll have a foot in the grave before he gives up making content for Supercoach, which is great because he's someone I love listening to. Um, whether or not he does it with Eno next year and whether it's still FTT, FTTV, uh, don't know. But uh, as far as I'm aware, like they're not planning to end it. And I definitely wasn't a core member of it. I mean, I've obviously been an active participant and of love being part of it, but it was always George and Eno's baby. So um, yeah, no, me, my, my departure doesn't mean the end of that at all. Will I miss posting is a really interesting question. I think in some ways, yeah, I will, uh, because it, you know, like while there are parts that I definitely didn't enjoy over the last year, it did mean that every week you had people to talk to. Um, you could like vent about your trades, talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. And I'd also get lots of great ideas from um, commenters on, you know, trades and things to do during the week and little tips of information and insight. So I think there are definitely parts of it that I'll miss. The actual process of creating the content, you know, feeling the pressure to be across as much as I was and all that type of stuff. I won't, I won't miss that part as much at all. Um, and then any any plan to start a collaborative podcast? I mean, as you can probably imagine, just from my talking so far, there's no plans for me to get into active content in other ways. All right, so Supercoach thoughts. Who would love as part of this video? What were some of your lessons learned? How did you adopt to more trades? I, I'm thinking this is in the context of this year. Um, so it's I haven't reflected on it too much yet. So I would say, obviously, the big disaster to finish out this year has been um, not having any trades left for these last few rounds and getting lots of injury outs, which is really interesting juxtaposed to the year before where I held trades to the end of the year. We didn't really get any injury issues and people were able to go four weeks, um, you know, with zero, you know, four or five weeks with zero trades and, and be fine. I think this year I had something like six weeks left with three trades to go and an extra premium. And I still ran out uh, of trades at the end. So, uh, is there any lessons in that? Look, maybe, um, but I would say, and, and this possibly comes into like, like 
two and three, answering questions two and three here. But I, I think the dominant strategy is still the dominant strategy, which is you use these trades very aggressively and hope to coast to the end. I think that is ultimately still the best strategy. There are going to be years like this where you get punished for it. Um, but unfortunately, that, like, that doesn't mean that next year you should be more conservative, hold trades at the end, um, and, and hope others, you know, get injuries. Cause I just think it's less likely than more likely. We had a particularly bad year this year after a particularly good year last year. And the middle is probably the right approach. Maybe the one lesson in it though, is getting a nice, healthy bench, even post buys is useful, but I do think that is challenging in its own right. For example, Dowling looked like a walk up rookie this year. Uh, and he still got dropped, you know, multiple times, or at least once um, on the way home when you thought he'd continue to get games. Um, so it, it, it's hard. I think, you know, even the people that had rookie coverage, some of it feels more good fortune than bad fortune um, when it came to like who was still around at the end because rookies at debut halfway through the year are unlikely to be the best rookies and still be there at the end of the year. But for some people, it ended up working out really well and for others, it didn't. So... Yeah, um, I think that's pretty hard. Maybe the other lesson um, with round zero is not to overreact too much, which I think everyone will say, but like, yeah, there were some things that we stuffed up because of overreacting. So for example, I didn't start Cherry and I started Grundy because of round zero, which was a mistake. Um, but there were lots of people that were going to start, say, Goulden, for example, before round zero and got off him and overreacting was absolutely correct. Uh, there were lots of people who weren't going to start Heaney and then overreacted to round zero and got him in. So I think in general, round zero was probably more reflective than less reflective for a lot of those popular premiums and reacting to it or overreacting to it was actually correct. So unfortunately, I think if round zero persists, that is going to continue. Um, so yeah, maybe strong rookies, but that's hard to do. Reacting to round zero seems appropriate. Um, being aggressive with your trades still makes sense. I like. I think those are probably my lessons for this year, which may be counterintuitive to what some people will talk about, but I'm actually really curious for next um, preseason's content. If we do have round zero again, what other content creators are going to say and whether or not they agree with that sentiment or if they have taken out different bits from this. I, I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, do you like the way SE is moving forward in terms of the rule changes? And do you, where do you see the game super going in the future? Okay, so um, I still have the belief that the rule changes overall have been positive. I think more trades is good. I know this is not a popular opinion, not a popular opinion at all, especially uh, amongst like more serious super coach um, circles. And they don't want to see extra trades as it moves the game more towards a fantasy like format. Um, but I think boosts added an uh, element of the game, which is really interesting and I've enjoyed them a lot. And I also think at this time of the year, like we've seen the same thing play out as last year where the, the correct strategy is to be aggressive and get lucky. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. That's just not very fun. I'd rather just have the trades and continue to be able to cover injuries rather than be um, uh, at the whims of, of the gods. Now, like my counterpoint to this is there is actually skill in picking players that are less likely to be injured, um, which I, I think is... Um, yeah, like something that's worth practicing and, and something I've looked into before, which injuries are more or less likely to repeat after what time frames, all that type of stuff. But when we have a, a game which is going more in the direction of concussions mean weeks or multiple weeks, and it is easy to get suspended than ever before, it's not just about predicting injuries, it's also predicting about other factors, which I do think are a little bit more luck-based uh, than some of the others. So... Um, I would actually like to continue to see more trades. I would like to see it go the way of fantasy and have two a week, um, plus the boost on top of that, which once again is not popular, but I think that's probably right. Uh, do you think it has strong enough base players? Will it fade away? Uh, so any, any changes you'd make to give it the best chance to continue to uh, grow strong? So, I mean, I think the changes I've discussed would make sense. I also like what fantasy's done in terms of utility. I think it's a really great spot. Wouldn't mind seeing that in terms of super coach. In terms of things that I think the game for super coach can do to improve, there are a few things that I have been probably persistent in saying over the last few years, and I haven't seen any reason to change. So, uh, where to start? Where to start? Um, 
So firstly, I think the platforms could do a better job at um, supporting or highlighting content creators within the broader community because these people uh, bring a lot of attention to the game, make it easier for casuals to be good at it and participate and enjoy it. And I think we've seen it in explosions, uh, at, like in um, like NFL fantasy and other you know EPL fantasy, all these type of things. These types of content creators uh, really add to the game and the community around it, which gets people more involved uh, and playing. And I do think that they could be doing more to support those um, around them and uplift them and highlight them and showcase them. And I think that would bring more interest to the game in the long run. So, um, yeah, I think supporting those who support the game would make a lot of sense. Uh, the actual game changes I've probably talked about a little bit already, which is as it currently stands, the dominant strategy is not particularly fun for me. So I'd either add more trades or look at other innovative ways to prevent that being the winning strategy in a given year. Um, and then I, I think the design challenge the game design challenge which is really interesting to think about is should they be building to cater to like pros or sweats or no lifers uh, or um, the more casual fan and which of these actually builds a better player base now there are lots of games that are very casual friendly that have very few players um, uh, and then there are games which are catered just towards like the experts and a, a very difficult large skill curves and have very big player bases that are very passionate to give like a quite a reductive example maybe would be chess versus checkers checkers is more casual friendly than chess is but chess is the much more popular of the two games and people assume that by building a game for casuals you end up with a bigger fan base but i don't think that's true i think you need to have enough skill built into the game that applying more craft and trade to it is actually worthwhile and you can see return on it. So um, I believe that the games could continue to build strong into the future, but making changes which reinforce that skill, which build the community, I think those are like pretty important ones that, you know, which is where more emphasis could could be put into. I think the other interesting trend to think about is for a lot of other leagues around the world, this overall format that we play is not the most popular. It's around draft and why that's the case and whether or not it makes sense to invest more into draft and what that would look like. I personally don't love the draft formats in AFL. I play them for NFL, for example, uh, but I, I do really like the overall format in this. I think it's better for the most part, to be honest. So I don't know, maybe there is something in that and draft is actually a really good way to, to grow the base, but... Yeah, that's, that's the last one. So anyway, that's, those are some thoughts, a bit unstructured off the top, but there you go. Uh, if you could change about one thing about fantasy super... Oh, actually, this this question brings me to one last thing here. Transparency on supercoach scoring. They really... It's about time they do it. You've got people like um, Jaden who... Stats by Jaden, if, if you haven't seen his website, that have broken down and reverse engineered basically what most of the scoring is. I know it's a proprietary model, but you could make it so much more clear what players are getting scored for individual things. You're half owned by the AFL. Like who's, who are you competing with? They're not buying anyone else. This hiding how they do player rankings and the score stuff. It's just so silly. It's uh, like not good for the game when people can't figure out which players are scored for what thing. So opening the data, both behind how Supercoach is scored and the AFL data more broadly is last thing could be done to give the, the games the best chance of growing strong. All right, so if you could change one thing about the scoring, what would it be? Ooh, I haven't thought about this one much. Oh, actually, I know what it is for Supercoach really easily. Uh, the, the, there's two things for Supercoach. So one is um, the way that uh, deliberate out on the full and insufficient intent is scored. So for insufficient uh, kicks in Supercoach, you get given two clangers, one for a clanger kick and one for the free kick against. When you kick it out on the full, you only get a clanger for the clanger kick. You don't get a free against. These things are completely inconsistent and should be the same. They are under the same rule of the AFL rulebook. They are applied in the same way, but for one of them, the free kick is given against the team, and for one of them, it's given against the player. And because of that, 
One ends up being two clangers rather than just one, which is ridiculous. You cannot have one action and turn the ball over twice or clang it twice, which is how it is currently scored within Supercoach. So that is absolutely top of the list. The second for me is how they score efficient kicking. I think kicking over 40 meters long to a contest being effective, you know, even when it goes like a two or one stuff, it's just a poor measure. I, I do empathize though, because I think like the gold standard would be here trying to evaluate, did they make the best decision, right? Like, did they kick it to someone that was uh, most open? And maybe there was no one open short and kicking it long to that contest is the best thing they can do and it should be effective. But there are other times where players boot it long when they have a short corridor kick that's 20 meters um, completely uncontested and they should have hit that up. The problem is the effective long kick scores more points than hitting the corridor kick. And so uh, what it, this boils down to is effective kicks in Supercoach don't really have any understanding of like threat or impact. Um, it's just long, short and effective or not. And so, yeah, I think that's like the other thing in Supercoach I'd probably look into most heavily as one that is worth, you know, considering and redoing. Uh, for fantasy, not so much. Um, fantasy uh, is just raw stats. Uh, look, maybe you could bring in some of the one percenter or spoil stats, but I, I, without having a look at it and the effect of it, I don't know if that's necessarily worthwhile. It may end up unbalancing the scoring. All right, and what do fantasy community need to come to terms with about fantasy? I'd say there's two things here that come to mind for me. So one, um, to win, you uh, cannot be casual. The idea of a casual winning these games now seems really foreign to me. And look, it may be that that happens one year, but I can almost guarantee you that everyone that's won fantasy and Supercoach over the last handful of years is watching almost every game. They are consuming multiple hours of content each week um, and they are spending like all their free time thinking about the game. It, it is not a game where casuals win anymore. So I don't think we should be designing it necessarily for casuals or pretending that casuals can win. You can absolutely be a casual and enjoy it and play against your friends and have a great time. But the overall competition, I don't think really caters to that audience. Uh, and the second thing is like maybe more strategy or stats based is I don't think as a whole enough people understand like regression concepts and what it means. This is like the same reason why we bet against, for example, who won the Brownlow last year or who top scored in their line last year. It is very rare for you to have an outlier year where you are the best mid or the best player in the competition and then back it up the following year or, or exceed it. You tend to regress back to the mean or the norm including just for your own performance, right? Like if I have my best career year, I'm I'm unlikely to, to improve on that again next year. So um, I think, yeah, regression concepts and how it affects like who you should pick and not is one that's like um, underestimated. And the same thing in the middle of the year, right? Like if a player has underperformed through the first like 10, 12 games, you would kind of expect them to have positive regression in the back half of the year, but we too often miss that. Uh, so yeah, that's, um, that's one I think about. All right. What have been your favorite moments from this year? Uh, geez, I don't feel like I had many that I absolutely loved. I'd have to go back and look through the trades. There was one week where I got in Caldwell and someone else that was just like two amazing trades at the same time. So whoever I brought in that other week, that's probably it. Um, but yeah, like there wasn't a ton of moments this year that I absolutely love from uh, me playing the game perspective. Lots of like fun in the community and that type of stuff. So I'd probably point to that. Uh, what's been my favorite Supercoach trade of all time? I don't really have an all-time list. I must say one of the things I'm wor like bad at is remembering my real like wins, like my real highs and lows from previous years, which I think is actually probably a strength. That's you know part of the reason why maybe I don't have a never again list because... Um, I can kind of forgive players and understand why the pick did or didn't work out. But the the slightly longer answer to this is it's always going to be whenever you're on a unique and no one else is. That is by far the best part of, of the game when you've nailed that pick that no one else has. Uh, for example, like when I started Wits and he absolutely gunned it, ended up being like a top two keeper record mid pricer and not many people had him like, you absolutely love that type of stuff. It's your favorite things. It's it's never like starting with the bond and bond being good for everyone, like boring. It's yeah, these really unique ones that you jump on. That's that's probably the most fun that you ever have. There was also the year where um jumping on Tex and like around, I want to say like two or three when he was on this insane heater. 
and he he went up like 100 150k and it, the trade didn't work out perfectly but that was a very fun like month to be on him so yeah those those ones are pretty good but yeah uh my, my favorite ever trades oh, like i don't really keep a list of them it's such a boring answer but yeah any anytime you get on a unique wits text and they're probably the ones that come to top of mind and i'm sure i'm missing some even better ones all right, who is your one or two locks in each line to be the top of their line over the next five years? Obviously projecting where people will play. Oh, this is a tough one. Very tough one. Um, especially for forward, because who who knows where people are going to play? Like the next five years is such a long projection as well for key forwards. I mean, you're probably looking at like Darcy or Yugelhagen for the forwards, really. Uh, for the mids, I think it's going to be hard to go past Dacos, honestly. He just has a game built for super coach and fantasy. Uh, but like other young, and like five years is about when he should be hitting his straps. You still have players like Sheasel, uh, who's shown a lot this year that could be up there as well. But uh, I don't think that'll be the case. And you're going to have some of these other guys starting to fall off that are, you know, maybe in their primes now. Someone like Sarong obviously has a game that's built well for super coach. It could be someone like him uh, too. But yeah, like Dacos feels like the safe answer there. Boring, but safe. Best ruck in five years from now? Well, it has to be Cherry as of right now. Cherry or Marshall, I think, both in the age bracket where that probably makes sense. Um, otherwise, Tom DeConing obviously showed a lot this year, and I think he could he could be one that's right up there. Uh, and then in defense, uh, I'm sure there's something really obvious that I'm missing here because a lot of the top defenders that would be thinking about are either going to be retired or... We'll be playing halfbacks here. Like McCurch is probably not playing halfback. Sheasel and Dacos probably won't be defender eligible anymore. <laughs> Honestly, it's probably someone that's not in the league yet that's playing this um, laughable role as a rookie. Who are the other halfbacks I can think of? Like Whitfield will be too old by then, I would imagine. I don't know why I can't think of anyone. Sorry. Let's... Um... Oh... Um, Nass, Wangani Miller, that'll be, that'll be my pick for defense. Cause I think that's where he'll stay. I don't think he gets merged up the ground. Maybe they put him to a wing, but yeah, I like him out of defense. So that'll, that'll be the one and you'll have Sinclair possibly gone by then. All right. This is the one page where I actually prepared something ahead of time. So get excited. Um, so on the right here, I've got my super coach all-star team, and then I'll go into which, which players I think were the goats of super coach. So, um, what I've tried to do is based on my knowledge of, you know, since I've been playing and really a little bit before then try and pick out, you know, the best players from certain eras that have sufficiently played in that role and were like top scorers for a certain number of years and put them all into a side. Now I'm sure I've missed some people. So please hit me up with who you think I've missed, but um, yeah, in defense, you got, yeah, Stuart, Hodge, Simpson, Enright, Shaw, and Lloyd. Uh, I think I'm missing who I took out someone for Heath Shaw. I don't think which I think it was Laird because Laird obviously had a fair few good years as a defender, but I don't think he had enough there. Um, but yeah, I think this is a pretty like solid defense. There's um, a few here that I think like really pioneered who we looked for in Supercoach role. So Jake Lloyd was that like that seagull half back. Um, Simpson like kind of same era, but I'd say he like pioneered more like the plus one where Lloyd was like the pure seagull kick in vulture. And then Tom Stewart, I would say like really highlighted the benefits of that intercepting role. Now there are others that have done that as well, but Stewart uh, has obviously been, been very impressive and, and been a consistent high scorer during that period of time. So yeah. And right. Very good around the late 2000s, early 2010s bit before I played, but I am aware of the numbers and same with Hodge from back then as well. Um, there are some other good ones like, you know, Sam Mitchell and stuff, but they probably just didn't play defender enough Laird. Um, yeah. So those are, those are some decent picks. Sinclair probably yeah, didn't have enough premium years there. So yeah, there's some good ones. All right. In the middle, there is like, this is actually really hard to pick. Uh, and so, yeah, there are some that I have missed here, but Gary Ablett was an absolute phenom for basically the entire time that he played, whether it was forward or midfield. Uh, yeah. Huge. Pendlebury has to be the most consistent and like was an absolute phenomenal top scorer over most of his career. Oliver, we'll see if he bounces back after the last couple of years, but how quick he peaked in year two and then being like top one or two for like five or six years, I don't think it can go unnoticed. Um, Merritt, I guess, is a little bit in the mold of like a mini Pendlebury in the sense that 
maybe his highs haven't been the absolute highest, although Pendlebury did have like number one years. So, so this is probably a bad comparison. Um, but the consistency and the reliability of Merritt is, I think, the most since we had De Pendlebury. Uh, Danger just had some amazing years where he was right up there and very super coach friendly game style. Neil has obviously done it again this year and just yeah has continued to get it go- done across two clubs. Marcus Bonampelli, I would say, is like the best modern day player we've had probably outside of Oliver, but it looks like Bont will go past him um, over the next few years, I'd say. And then McRae has been an absolute phenom as well. Uh, I mean, like Dusty obviously had a couple of good years, but it was probably more relevant as a forward than as a mid. Uh, and I'm missing a couple of maybe like the fantasy guys here, like Dane Swan and Tom Rockliffe, you could point to as well, who had really good patches. Uh, Fife probably didn't do it for long enough. But yeah, blessed for lots of great midfielders over the years. But there's there's eight of the best there. In the rucks, I've gone for Gorn and Cox, both the dominant number one rucks of their era when it came to super coach scoring. And then the forwards, as you can imagine, this was absolutely awful because trying to consider who actually played enough years as a forward to like be worthwhile for consideration here. It really cuts down the list, but uh, a lot of them were the key forwards of like the 2000s because that was when key forwards still still mattered and could score a lot. So Nick Rewalt, Pavlich, Jonathan Brown, Buddy Franklin, all up there. And then I think two of the more modern ones. So Dunkley, even though he's now mid only now, he still had many good seasons as a forward and ended up being a lock for many of those. And Heaney, Maybe he hasn't always been the best um, in there, but he's been there or thereabouts consistently and has provided some of the best content via Jords. The next one here for me is which plays is the GOAT of Supercoach? So I would say over the like last four or five years, there's a handful of names that stick out to me as being you know consistent top performers. And they would be Pizza Safety, Legend Henry, No Second Prizes, and Dyslexia Untied. Those are probably the four best, four or five best players over that period of time that have been consistent. Um, uh, Dyslexia or like Tommy now uh, creates content with Mora's Magic, which is absolutely worth listening to. And you can follow him on Twitter. And I think, uh, well, Henry, I know you can definitely follow on Twitter. I'm pretty sure No Second Prizes and Pizza have Twitter, Twitters you can find as well. Apologies, I don't know them off the top of my head. But yeah, those are the ones I'd point to as probably like the ones that have had the most consistent performances. And that is what I rate. I tend to rate consistent performances over, um, you know, high spike years. But, you know, I, you could just pick the last five winners and say those are the best five. But no, for me, consistency and those, I think those ones have um, showed like very consistent performances over that period of time. I think I'm also missing another one like Hunter Punter maybe. Um, it's also been very consistent. So that might take it up to five. Uh, and then I guess from the content creator side, there's tons of good content creators. Um, but in terms of content creators that I think have had the most consistent performances over the last, you know, five years, I'd be looking at um, George, uh, Supercoach with DR, um, Dr. Supercoach's Pistol, um, uh, Selby from Murrow's Magic himself. Uh, and... I guess like you could also point at um, Abs Magic now as well. I mean, he hasn't been content creating for all of it, but it's definitely had like this year has been a great year for him and he had a, a really good year before he started as well. So um, those are probably ones I'd point to as having like the best um, performances over that period of time. So yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good list. There's others I could cover, but yeah. Uh, all right, so we're going into the content creation section now. So as a fellow podcast content creator, how can you be asked to keep on doing it, asking for a friend? Well, I guess the answer for me is I can't. I'm throwing in the towel. Um, this is going to lead into a little bit um, of it, but I figured out pretty early on what I did and didn't like about content creation. And so for the person that is um, starting a podcast with friends and wondering what mic audio setup I use as well as the software, I'll tell you in a second. But for me, I found out pretty early on, I didn't like the editing. Um, and I, I just don't have time for that. It's so much extra effort and time. So for me, it was always one take, which is exactly like this video or just one take, start to finish, uh, talk the whole way, don't pause and stop. And then, you know, cut out the, the start and the finish and hit upload. And that was about it. I don't like doing anything more than that. So for me, the actual talking about Supercoach is fun. Engaging with others is fun. The editing and stuff around it, not so much. So I just tried to streamline that as much as possible. Um, so for this second question, the microphone I'm using is a Rode NT USB microphone, which has been pretty good. It's just on a little boom mic. Um, and then the software I use, I use OBS. So it's a free software, recording software. There's lots of guides on YouTube for how to set it up. It's not too hard at all. 
Um, and once you've kind of got that set up and working, you can then really go into like optimizing how it looks and all that type of stuff. But I haven't done a lot of that. And then on the webcam, I am using a um, like a HD 1080p Logitech. Um, I can't remember the exact name. It's the popular one, HD something or other. Um, my other one broke, which was a Razer Keo ring light one. I think I prefer this one better. Um, yeah, like honestly, you can start sinking so much money into this. So I would probably start out with something easier and cheaper and make sure you enjoy it before you bother upgrading anything. Oh, and then the last thing is the editing software I use is um, VSDC, which is once again, another free one. Um, there, there are better paid ones out there, but I think it does the job for what I'm doing, which is not much editing really. It's just add thing on start and finish and, and kind of go from there. All right. Do you think being in the public eye impacts the way you think about your trades? Uh, I've thought about this a little bit. Um, I'm probably, so yeah, so I think the short answer is yes, because I don't want to be misleading with my trades. I want to make sure that the trades I'm putting out are the trades I'm going to do. I don't want to have to hide them from the community um, or others whatsoever. If I'm, you know, putting on the platform, I don't want to like bait people into bad trades. So uh, I, I think it means that I am maybe more hesitant than not to change my opinion later in the week when I, when I possibly could. Um, and it also probably means I'm less likely to go, you know, high risk trades, I'd say during the year or as risky as I could be because um, I, generally it's not the best way to play and it's reserved for those that like really understand the ins and outs of games, the risk they're taking on. And I, I think it's kind of irresponsible as a content creator to like promote really, really risky trades um, uh, all the time. So yeah, I, I'd say it does a little bit, not heaps, but it does a little bit. What's been my biggest challenge when it comes to making content? Probably already touched on a little bit. I just don't like editing that much. It's just not that fun. I think there's a lot more that could be done with editing than what I do. I'd love to see like that TV level um, quality where you like bringing in AFL footage and like showing stuff, highlights like stoppage setups and all that type of thing. The reality is AFL doesn't let me. I've tried doing that stuff before, but they flag content when I try and say like, this is why I do or don't like certain players uh, at stoppages because of how they're setting up. I just can't show that stuff. I'd love to go that next level of analysis. And back to the other thing, knowing that it's only going to be relevant for three or four days before it becomes completely useless, it does make it hard to like be motivated to edit and put those things together um, just for it to go away. Uh, and then would you have any advice for someone looking to get into making Supercoach content? So the I do. Um, I have a tweet thread here from... Uh, start of January, 2023, which I'll include in the comments below. And in here, I kind of talk about a whole bunch of tips, which I think are still relevant um, to today, um, which basically talk about a whole bunch of things. Like, so for example, don't jump into this for the money. You will not make a lot of money doing this. You'll make some, there's some decent money to be made. And if you really monetize hard and you have a big platform, you can do all right, um, but it's not going to replace your day job. Um, and, uh, if you're doing it just for the money, you're going to take a long time to see any return anyway. So like, uh, you know, things, so there's stuff like that. I I'd say the other big tip, um, in here is like, really make sure you know what you are, what you are going to be known for and unique with. So what I ended up, um, kind of making my content around, which is like strategy and getting involved in that side of the game, um, and being like, you know, something that I th think does like really expert kind of commentary meant that it created a rod for my back where I, I probably couldn't keep doing it forever, where if I was more fun um, and jovial and joking with my content and that was what I did, then I could have probably kept doing this for a lot longer because people wouldn't be coming to me for the best advice. They'd be coming to me for fun and relief and lightheartedness. So um, yeah, think about like what makes your content you, why you'd keep enjoying doing it in the future um, and be in it for the right reasons. They're probably like the biggest tips I can give, but yeah, check out that thread if you're serious about it and you can go from there. All right, rank your top three favorite Supercoach YouTubers to watch. Um, this We're getting a little bit spicy with some of these and I, I don't want to put people offside, so apologies in advance. Now, I will quickly say that I have not watched a lot of YouTube content this year. And in fact, I haven't listened to much content at all whatsoever. Um, just because I haven't had the time, like honestly, haven't had the time. So, um, of those who I would have watched, like George's probably up there. Um, I watched a bit of Ball Boys Fantasy, which I really like. Um, Mitch Casey and whatnot, like he's good. 
Um, in terms of YouTubers, um, oh, like a bit of Supercoach with DR I've seen this year, but I, I tend not to have time to sit down and watch YouTube. So it tends to be more the podcast side and, you know, would have listened to a bit of um, Mora's Magic this year and a bit of DRC this year. Um, so they're probably the ones I would I would lean to. Uh, like um, Supercoach Insider, I probably would have watched a bit of them this year and they were one of the podcasts I really enjoyed um, before I started making my own. So, you know, shout out to them. Um, and we're going to talk about the next one a little bit, which is the, uh, Scottfather, um, Abs Magic himself. So <laughs> as people seem to think I have some type of beef with, um, Abs, I don't, and I've come to appreciate him more and more with time as well, um, uh, which is great. He makes some really good, unique content. And I think the community needs more people like that, that are just trying different things and being unique or themselves. Um, and he, I think f has continues to find a good blend of, of humor and memes, like the amount of, I just kind of calm it down and stuff I see on Twitter. Like, you know, that stuff is clearly striking a chord with the community, which is great. You love to see people like really being able to build, you know, memes and humor around that stuff. It's awesome. And I think he also is someone that's really aggressive uh, and I like seeing more aggressive rather than conservative um, players of the game. And I also think he's done a really good job this year of identifying left field picks that have panned out and worked, which is once again, really good as well. It's very easy to jump on as a content creator and just go straight down the line, pick the obvious ones and leave it at that. Um, so yeah, he, I think he's been a breath of fresh air and I, um, yeah, like all I can do is kind of respect how well he's done both in terms of uh, he's had another great year this year, which is not easy to do when you are creating content. I think it is genuinely harder to have top um, finishes when other people uh, can see your moves and your thought process every week. So that's really cool. And yeah, like to, to do it with a um, unique brand that is shot up in terms of like viewership. So yeah, like, yeah, amazing. I've got nothing but um, nice things to say about abs. Um, yeah, like people will point to like the little Twitter thread, but in the preseason shit, like just a complete misunderstanding um, and like really comes down to um, <laughs> what we consider respect to be like quite different, which is just a reflection of like upbringing and all that type of stuff. But this is also the problem with like social media and Twitter, because in 140 characters, you can um, say a lot of things that get interpreted poorly. Um, and, uh, once we talk to each other in like the DMs and all that type of stuff, um, like, yeah, I've got nothing but positive things to say about him. Um, I, I'd hope it's the same for me, but if he doesn't, then that's fine. It doesn't change how I feel about, uh, abs uh, at all. So yeah, yeah, I like, I like him a lot. I think he's been a great add to the community over the last couple of years. Um, all right. And then the third one here. So who is your favorite non FTTV, uh, podcaster to podcast with? I've been really lucky to, um, go with a fair few, like on the super, I think my answer to this would actually be maybe the most fun I had was with, um, the hat chat boys in the preseason this year. And it was mainly just because maybe it was not like non super coach. I could kind of just have fun with it. I could joke and like be a bit crude and I really enjoyed that. So that's probably the one that comes to mind um, off the top of my head. Um, in terms of like, who's easy to talk with? Uh, like I found mini monk always really easy to talk with. Uh, maybe just cause we, we think alike. Um, so that's probably another one that I'd point to. Honestly, I haven't probably podcasted with enough super coach podcasters. I tend not to get asked. I don't know if people think I'm scary to approach or my style doesn't really work with what they're trying to do, but I haven't like done a ton outside of that. So they're probably the two that I'd um, point to, but there are lots of like fantasy people that I've done podcasts with, which I've really enjoyed. So um, Selby, Morris Magic, um, uh, Bales, um, fan of fantasy fanatics coaches panel like there's tons of really good ones out there but yeah they're just just a, a few oh and actually um the drsc like podcast we did maybe a couple of pre-seasons ago was one of my favorites and i wish we'd done more of them and just never ended up working out with like timing and all that type of stuff because they they have a different philosophy i think to us a lot of the time and it's always good to like go uh from a different directions all right, some uh, questions I've just drank, like uh, put in as meme questions because honestly, that's what they feel like. English or Spanish? I know the meme. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Um, all right. Can you drink some Fanta, please? <laughs> I, I think I know exactly who this is. And unfortunately, I don't have any Fanta in the house. Um, all right. How much wood could woodchuck, chuck, woodchuck, could chuck wood? Uh, I, I need to actually know the answer to the question so I could play it back at you. But tongue twisters are not going to get me after this many years in front of a, a camera. I know I still fumble over my words. And I still speak too fast, but you got to get me sleeping to trip over something like that. Is it Lucy single season? Of course it is Lucy single season. Every season is Lucy single season. And talking about my favorite trades I've ever done, AFLW last year going Kate Hoare to Lucy single after round one, we called it like the worst goaded trade of all time because even though Lucy single ended up being this amazing mid-price forward option that we jumped on, Kate Hoare <laughs> I think had a 140 the week after, which was insane for a, a W score. Like you don't see too many of those in the forward line. So um, yeah. Yeah, Lucy single season, absolutely always. Hopefully takes it to another level in the mids this year. And then shout out to Poundy. Okay, we will do that. Was Bales a generational FTTV member until his undeserved ban? Honestly, I could not remember what Bales is from any of the other like 18-year-old generic meme edgelords that get banned over the course of a year. No, you wouldn't have even ranked in the top 10, mate. And I'm sure the, deserve, the ban was well-deserved. Since you're freeing yourself of burdens, would you consider supporting Tazzy and finally letting go of the Bombers? Oh, I've talked about this with a few people that <laughs> when GWS started and me being in Sydney now, I should have just jumped on. They had, you know, some of the old Essendon fellas there. It was the perfect opportunity and I didn't take it. I've got a Tassie Foundation membership, but unfortunately no no connection to Tassie. So as much as I'd like to, I think I'm probably stuck um, with the Bombers unless we do something insane like Lee and Cameron. If we hired Lee and Cameron, I genuinely said I would move to GWS and now I kind of wish they had had, so I had the excuse. And then will Tanner Pro be a good pick for next year? Now, I don't know if this was intended to be a meme or not, but it has to be right because there's absolutely no way. Uh, maybe if he had forward status, but he won't. How does it feel knowing that you'll never be an official SC expert now? It feels fine. Um, like, I don't think I was ever going to be one. Um, uh, like, I don't want to uh, reopen old wounds here, but I think there are other people that deserve it far more than me that haven't got it by now. And so if they're not getting it, then I, I can't imagine that I ever will get it. But I hope they change their policy on this because that SC expert way is like an easy way for fans of the game to get involved with the favorite content creators, add them to the leagues and, and be a part of it. So yeah, it's actually, you know, a bit of a shame that more people aren't being added to that because I think it's one of those ways that you can support content creators and it, yeah, hasn't happened enough. How do you get people to actually engage because they're lazy and stupid? Now I put this in the memes because I'm hoping it wasn't a serious question. I will somewhat answer this. That is to say, you cannot get people to engage with you. Um, they, the viewers, they owe you nothing at all. Uh, they will listen and comment and engage and interact with you if they enjoy, if you provoke, if you get them thinking, but you can't expect that of someone else. Um, you absolutely can never expect that of someone else. You only get out what you put in and all that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, please don't call your, your viewers lazy and stupid because I think that is the surefire way to never get them to listen. If you can't respect them, um, I don't know how you'd possibly engage them in ways that, that they'd be respectful of. All right, so I think we'll end it there. We've um, chalked up some good one and I just wanted to finish once again on a big thank you. There was an outpouring of love and support from, from people when I kind of said that I was wrapping up across, yeah, Twitter, YouTube and a, a couple of other places as well. Uh, and so I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being fans um, and viewers and commenters and haters over the last year. It has been a pleasure to be part of the community and to be a, well, hopefully leave a contrib contribution, hopefully help you improve your game. Um, so yeah, I wanted to say once again, thank you very much and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.